Today I'm going to show you how I made a deep house track that got released on Steve Bug's label Sublease, has been played by Mihai Popovicio, Claptone, John Digweed, and of course Steve Bug himself, and is quickly climbing up the Beatport charts. Let's get into it. Hey guys, Dilby here. Welcome back to the channel. It's been a while since I did a walkthrough on one of my tracks. So I did a poll on Patreon and the track that most people wanted to see was Under Your Skin, which is a new one of mine on Steve Bug's label Sublease. It's the track that's playing in the background and there's a link in the description if you want to go and check it out on Beatport and Spotify. The whole release has been really well received, getting some great support from big DJs and climbing up the Beatport charts. So today I'm going to open up the project, get under the hood and show you how I made it. If you like this type of content, one of the best ways to support the channel is through Patreon. There's a link in the description if you want to go and join up. Becoming a patron means you can vote on polls like the one I did for this video, you can download the project files for the tutorial videos I do, you can also submit your tracks for my feedback live streams and there's a Discord server coming soon. Now let's jump into Ableton and check this project out. Alright, so this is the project for Under Your Skin, out now on Sublease, link in description. <laughs> so let's just jump in and have a look through the project. You heard it in the intro, but here's a quick little refresher. Before we actually jump into the sounds and what's made up with the track, I'll just talk a little bit about the arrangement, which you can see here. It's a pretty standard kind of club arrangement for a deep house track. I use these markers in Ableton. So you just go to where you want a marker, right click, add locator, and then you can type in a name here. Uh, we'll just call it test, right? Or you can right click on it, rename, new test. So you just call that whatever you want, or in this case, we will delete it. And this is just a really helpful way to kind of navigate around your project quickly. If I don't have those, and then I've got a bunch of things open, and I'm down here working on this, I'm not sure where this breakdown is. Uh, this just tells me that there's a breakdown, so it always allows me to keep oriented in the project and understand where I am in the arrangement without kind of keep scrolling up to the top to see the kick, because I use the kick to identify the arrangement with these different colors. This is just showing where I've filtered out the kick. One more thing about the arrangement, I'm always talking about on my channel about using reference tracks. Now I've used a reference track here, it's a Frink track from Bondage Music, really cool track, doesn't really sound anything like what I've done, but I'm familiar with the track and I like the arrangement and I thought something similar could work here. I'll just play you a little bit of that. See, pretty different. So what I've done is basically used the structure of this track to map out my arrangement and then it looks like I've tweaked it a little bit because it didn't quite work for me for the track. And this is pretty consistent with the way that I always arrange tracks. I tried to really get a foundational arrangement in like somewhere between 5 and 20 minutes, barely even listening to it, if at all, and just kind of painting in the blocks so that I've got a rough arrangement. If I'm uninspired and not sure what to do, I will copy a reference track like this. Just put the elements down and I can always go back and change it and tweak it. But it goes from being a loop to being a track. And that allows me to overcome the hurdle of arranging. Got a track that's arranged, I just need to tweak it and make it better. I always used to arrange starting from here and have a loop with all my elements and then add my elements one by one going forward. But what I always found happened is by the time I got to kind of one minute into the track, I'd already used a lot of my elements because I kept thinking to myself, oh, it's getting boring, it's getting boring, something needs to happen, but it doesn't. This is an extended mix. This is a DJ club arrangement and nothing really much needs to happen here because this is when a DJ is mixing in. This is when the track kind of starts and the last track is being kind of mixed out and then Maybe this is the main important part of the track. So after I've done my really rough arrangement, I will pretty much focus on this kind of section here. What's leading into the main break, what's leading out of the main break. And once I've got that kind of nailed down, that flow of energy between those two sections, I can then use that to inform what should happen here. So this should lead into this break, come out of here and lead up to this break. And the same thing here, it should lead into this break and into the outro. 
So that's kind of like a mindset shift of how to go about arranging in a really practical way. Anyone who's been watching my videos for a while will recognize immediately the color coding system and the layout that I use. And I describe that in this video here. So check that out if you're interested. It's also available to download from my Patreon. And you can download the exact version that I use or a version I've recreated using a combination of Ableton and free plugins. So let's jump in and take a look at the kick first. Just a kick from a sample pack, probably from Loop Cloud. You can see Loop Cloud here. I talk about this on the channel a lot. It's actually a game changer. If you're not using it, I recommend you use it. I think Splice now has a VST version that integrates into a DAW, so you can listen to things in time and in key and audition them in context. But the auditioning in context is the game changer part. Being able to sync up and audition loops from Loop Cloud or Splice before you buy them and bring them into your project. So anyway, the kick, pretty standard 4-4 kick pattern. These pink sections here represent where this auto filter comes on and off. Really standard in all of my tracks. This is basically how I paint in a rough arrangement. I, I do the kicks first, like where the kick's going to come out, and then I kind of do everything else around that, put in the markers, and I'm good to go. Uh, with the kick, all I've done is rolled off a little bit of the very low sub from 25 hertz, very gentle roll off. Then I'm using this standard clip, which is a clipper, and I'll show you without the clipper. This kick has a very sharp transient. So if I go to my master here, this Oscillus Megascope plugin, which I'm also often referencing on my channel, you can see the transient there. So that's got a really sharp transient, which could be a bit harsh in the club, but also it's gonna trigger the limiter on the master and any other compression that I use, like in this kick bass bus, for example. So what I'm doing here is just shaving off literally like a tiny amount of that transient. So when I turn on this clipper, you can see there it has a, you can see there it has a visual representation of what it's doing. And let's have a look at this. So it's just shaved off a little bit. Very subtle. Uh, if you don't have a clipper or don't know how to use one, you could also just use like the attack a little bit. I find using the clipper helps to keep the sound intact while avoiding the problems. But it, you really do want to be gentle, very gentle with the clipper. So that's the kick. Clap. Okay, so we've got a clap here. I'm rolling off any kind of low frequencies. I don't really want that kind of fundamental of the clap. I just want it to be giving like a nice nice tight punch with the when it's playing with the kick it's also taking off that kind of low mid is gonna stop it poking through on the limiter i've got a snare here which is just playing every couple of bars grooving with the clap and then we've got this extra clap loop so this is just a loop that I've got from Loop Cloud and use the envelope to pull out some hats. So that's playing the same pattern and you can hear that's quite a bit brighter than the other ones. And it's a bit wider. So layering is really good, I do it a lot. It's important to not overdo it and to do it with some kind of reasoning. What I'm trying to do here is add a bit more brightness and texture to the claps. So this first clap and snare that I had, had a nice punch, a nice basic sound, but I wanted something that was a bit brighter and gave a bit of texture on top. One more thing that I'm doing with the claps here, the processing, I've got uh, <laughs> I don't know, some processing. I'm not sure what this is doing. Let's have a listen. Not too much by the sounds of it. And I've got my standard clap reverb. Very subtle, just giving a little bit of space and ear around the clap. Uh, one more thing that we can see here is I've got a little bit of sends going on. 
This is to a uh, reverb. And this one's to a delay. Cool stuff. All right, let's take a look at the hats. Got a basic loop here. So it looks like I've chopped out the clap because I don't want it, I've already got some. And it's like a nice, short, tight, open hat with a little kind of tambourine groove there. Yeah, nice. And I'm layering that with an open hat. Just adding a bit more energy. You can hear this hat loop is quite bright. The open hat has got a bit more body to it. So if we look at the EQ curve. And then I've used a little bit of Haas widening just to spread the open hat out. You want to be careful with that. Um, make sure it's not phasing. On the loop, I'm using the Kilohertz Transient Shaper. This is part of the Slate Digital Pack, but I think you can also get this for free. Uh, check that out. So all I'm doing is just pulling off a little bit of the attack on this loop. Very subtle, but it's just really softening the attack. All of these hats playing together can start to get a bit harsh when the energy is building up on that transient. Uh, next, I've got a shaker loop. Panning that around with an auto pan, and I'm just adding a little bit of automation at the start here. I never automate on my channel faders. I say channel faders because it's this. Because I use that for mixing, I want to be able to adjust the levels without, without automation kind of being in the way. So I always automate either on an EQ or on a utility or some other gain knob. I've got some extra hats. which I've got some more Haas widening on it. And I think that will be, yeah, it's the opposite to the open hat. So that's delayed by 10 milliseconds on the right. And this is delayed by 10 milliseconds on the left. So it's just kind of spreading them out. So let's take a listen to the kick clap and then I'll bring in the hats. So this one here is really subtle and just kind of like filling in the gaps a little bit basically. But you can hear that as I bring those hats in with slightly different frequencies, so it's just kind of like filling out that hat groove. Nothing too complicated. Now we've got some percussion and this is a percussion loop, just I've called it perk texture. We're using the, yeah, I mean, yeah, it looks like exactly what I've called it. Let me just turn these groups off. So really subtle, but it just kind of adds a little bit of character. It stops the basic loop from feeling too bland. Then I've got this perk delay. So I'm just playing the first one of these. Cool just cutting off the low end. So all the drums together. So the drums are being processed through this drum bus. I've got a little bit of saturation, some gentle compression to just kind of control the transients. Turn all this stuff off. Okay, so this is the drums before mixing. Adding in a bit of saturation. Just adds a tiny bit of level, but a little bit of brightness as well. Adding in some compression. So it's just kind of, it's happening mainly on the open hats, pulling down the transient a little bit, and then I've got 0.9 dB of makeup gain, which is just pulling up everything else outside of the main offbeat hat and thickening up the hat by increasing the volume after the transient hits. Again, it's very subtle. I 
I think thickening is a good way to is a good word to describe it. Now I've got some parallel compression, which is basically doing the same thing. It's really heavy compression, but I've only got it at twelve percent. So it's pulling it down by ten dB and then adding ten dB of makeup gain. But I've only got twelve percent here. Let's hear what it sounds like. Awful. Without it. So it's just kind of adding a little bit of detail to the hats, basically. Very subtle, again. Decapitator, 8%. Again, nothing much. Very, very simple stuff. And then we've got a ozone imager which is just something that I've developed that I like for myself. And I basically just use this stereo wise and I think it starts about six and then I just pull it back till it sounds more natural. And it's just really pulling it out a little bit in the sides. Uh, and then I've just got a gain plugin, which isn't doing anything. I've got this auto filter, which I'm automating to bring down the frequency in the brakes. And it's going through Slate Digital Virtual Mix Rack with the Virtual Console Collection, which is just some very light saturation and coloring, doing like a digital emulation of summing. Then from the drum bus, I've got 26% sent to this drum reverb. There's just a preset that I've made in Slate Digital Verb Suite Classics, rolling off the lows, and then I'm side chaining it back to the drum bus. The reason I do that is so that I can have like a nice reverby sound, but then when the drums hit, the reverb is ducked, so it still gives them plenty of punch. Stops the drums getting washed out by the reverb, basically. So that is how I mix my drums. You can see one more thing here. I'm just using some sends. So this is like a big washy reverb, which I use to create like a white noise-esque fill sound, build sound. this kind of thing. It's just a very, very long uh, reverb. It just helps to kind of create like a white noise build up type sound, but I'm using elements within the track to create that sound by pushing them into a reverb. So it sounds very natural to the track. Then I've got some things being sent to a big delay, which is just like making the break a bit more chaotic. And then I'm bringing down the filter frequency. So it's kind of like getting a little bit le more chaotic, but a little bit less bright. So then when it all comes back and it's brighter and punchier, it really slams in and makes an impact on the drop. That's the drums and how I mix them. Very simple stuff. I've said this quite a lot, but I actually do most of the drum programming and stuff towards the end of the arrangement. And so I, when I did the arrangement, I assume I probably just had this. And... Maybe, the, maybe also the open hat. So I've tried to keep it really simple with the drums, especially when I'm writing, as I want the other elements of the track to be kind of like the main focus. I want the drums to really work with the personality of the track, whether that's vocals or melodic elements or whatever. All right, let's have a look at the bass. For this, I'm using Trillion, and this I've shown people a bunch of times on my channel. It's a preset called Dark Round Voyager, which I use frequently, very frequently. <laughs> So I've got a bit of processing going on here, some reverb, some compression just to control the transients, a photo, a little bit of delay, a bit of erosion, a little bit of delay. Very subtle delay, it just gives a little bit of groove to the bass. The main kind of sound design thing that I've got going on here is this erosion, which is adding like a bit crushed type sound to the bass. So 
So very almost bland sounding bass. I'm also sending it to a little bit of saturation and a little bit of reverb. So if I take all that off. Pretty bland sound. Becomes a lot more interesting. I'm always trying to make it a goal for myself to keep things simple, but make them work, I guess. So here's a good example of that simple bass pattern. So I would have just started with this first one, duplicated it, and made a little change. So I've just basically taken this note. Well, let's just do that. Okay, so there and duplicate and then turn that off move that to there i believe that's exactly what that's like yep ah and then bring that back so really really simple stuff and just creating like enough change to keep it interesting Another thing that helps to make the sound a little bit more interesting is just having this octave. I, I work with octaves a lot these days and on my bass. Way more interesting with that, I think. also works as like a rhythm, but this is just a whole nother level of interest in my opinion. Now let's take a look at the melodic elements. We've got quite a few, but all again pretty simple and it's just built up through a combination of simple, easy elements that are interacting with one another. So I'll start at the top, turn these off, we've got this tight plucks. And then it just has a little turnaround at the end here. So really simple stuff. We're in the key of D minor. So this is just playing the F down to the D minor, giving it a little bit of harmonic interest. It looks like I had kind of messed around with a few ideas and settled on simpler being better. Nice kind of interesting turnaround fill type thing and instead of happening at the end of the bar it's happening at the start which just makes it a little bit different as things often tend to happen at the end of the bar. Now we've got this chord stab it's just this happening on the 16th before the second kick in the bar just repeating so it's actually only one bar. And I've got a bunch of automation going on with the filter frequency, the resonance, and the frequency modulation, the envelope amount. And then I'm also sending it here in the breaks to this big reverb again. Now, both of these sounds are coming from Diva, I believe. Yep. All right. So this is also playing a power chord, and it's got Tell Chorus LX, which I use on almost everything. Free plugin, Diva. Okay, so I save some of my sounds, especially if I'm going to record a video because I don't want to lose them. This is very, very simple. It's pretty much everything I make is based on the template mini poly. So it is just two oscillators, one up an octave and turned down a bit. And this is a pulse wave and a square slash pulse wave. Tight, plucky envelope. Yeah, really, really simple stuff. A little bit of feedback to add some kind of saturation, no resonance. Yeah, really, really simple stuff. This is the other one, which is three oscillators, right? And I've got this oscillator here tuned down five semitones. So that's basically playing a power chord with this. And then we've got one up an octave. So it kind of makes this into a chord, which I believe I've saved. Yeah, under your skin, chord stab. A bit more resonance in this. A 
bit of feedback, a bit more white noise. Again, based on the same template, it's the mini poly. And all I do is I, I select the mini poly and then I change the envelopes to analog because I, I don't really like the mini Moog envelope style. Not a fan. One tip of what I always do when I'm using Diva is I put the accuracy to draft and the offline to best. That means that it's going to use less CPU when I'm using it in the project, but when I bounce it, it's going to use it as the best quality, as the highest quality. So a really simple sound design on those. Pretty much I always keep it simple on the sound design front. We can look at the MIDI of how those interact. So you can see that they're kind of interacting with the octave note on the bass line as well. What else have we got here? This womp sound, just a sample, added a bit of saturation, brought up some highs, brought up some more highs with the Slate Digital Fresh Air, free, so I grabbed that, Tail Chorus LX, told you I use it on pretty much everything, cutting out the lows. So this, simple stuff. So you'll notice that all these elements are really kind of simple and they're just placed so that they kind of work with one another. So everything's got space in the kind of timing. And then I also try to have things with different textures and frequencies so that they also have space in the frequency spectrum. But that is for the most part, I believe, what's making up the rhythmic section of the melodic elements. Except here I bring in a Wurlitzer. So you can see what's quite cool about this is I've got these different weird chords. You can see I've used the MIDI scale here and then hit the scale button. So it's only showing uh, notes that are in the scale of D minor. If you zoom right in here, I believe, oh, no, I thought I'd kind of made these a little bit off time, but it looks like I haven't actually. <laughs> Sometimes what I like to do is just grab these, hold Alt on my keyboard and kind of move them around. So that, just, that can just help to give it a real natural sound, but apparently I haven't done that here. In terms of the chords that are playing, I think, what is this? This is just playing the D, D. So I've got, so I'm playing the D, up an octave, the fifth and the third. Simple stuff. Without this and this. A bit more bland. So we're just kind of filling out the frequency a little bit. And then I'm just changing up the notes a little bit here. And I can I really do this just by experimenting. And then I'm just kind of changing them around on a few different notes. And I'm just I'm just kind of adding some variation by which which notes are playing, which keys are playing on each time to just give some variation. So it's still it's the same chord, but with just a little bit different texture and a different feel. Organic. I don't think there's much, if any automation happening on this channel. So everything is just kind of happening by the difference in notes that's happening with these keys. And then I've got a little kind of change to the riff at the end there, three notes. Still really simple. I don't play piano. I just put the stuff in by hand, listen to what works. It's a lot of trial and error generally. It's kind of important to just be patient, keep pushing until you hear something that sounds good. Sound source is just coming from Ableton. I've got Ableton Live Suite. This is part of the Live Suite sound sources. Decapitator for saturation. Not doing too much. And then sending it to a bit of delay and a bit of reverb. So that's pretty much all of the melodic elements done and dusted. And this just kind of really picks things up, adds a bit more character when it comes in. So you can hear those things are all kind of happening sequentially in a kind of rhythmic fashion. So I just use different elements with different sounds, different textures to really kind of build up this groove.
Now, one more thing that I bring in here is this deep chord. It's just a sample. It's happening on the one every four bars. You can hear there's kind of like some cool modulation. And that's happening from this echo device. So I've got it set to a 16th note, ping pong, decent bit of feedback, a little bit of reverb, but then I've got the, in the modulation section, I've got it set to like a pretty slow modulation and it's modulating the delay amount and the filter amount. So you can see here, I've got the filter set. So it's just moving these. And then it's also modulating the mix amount. So it's changing. And then on the character section, I've got it set to wobble. So if I turn this to 100, So that's just adding some of this kind of pitch modulation. Sounds really nice without the echo. A bit more bland. Just doing stuff like that that's like not synced with the tempo of the project. It's, it's synced to this LFO. Just helps to give a bit of an organic feel. This sounds like the same but slightly different every time. Now we've got some more kind of atmospheric elements. We've got this deep pad. Very easy, simple stuff. I'm using the gain on this, on this EQ to just ease it in and ease it out. But it's really just kind of adding a deepness and texture in the background. about the vibe. So what's happening here, I've got a sample and <laughs> this LFO is modulating the sample start so that it's always playing from a different position and it's just looping around. So every time that this note plays, it could be starting anywhere in the sample essentially. And it just helps it to keep moving and keep sounding slightly different each time it plays. Then it's going through an echo. I'm not sure if this is a, looks like a preset or I'm um, not too sure. No, just a standard echo quarter note ping pong a glue compressor to because it's changing all the time i want to keep it uniform uh, volume and then i've got this auto filter which is helping to add some movement it's got a little bit of lfo so it's just kind of moving this along it'd be really cool in ableton if they actually showed the automation on this as they do on quite a few devices like showed the movement i think it would be really helpful It's essentially just doing that, but more subtly. Then I'm just cutting out the low mids because this is where the kind of audible sound of my bass and a bunch of these plucks are, so I don't want to be muddying up that area. I don't often do harsh cuts like this, but as this is just such a kind of atmospheric element, it doesn't need any, any of those frequencies. Now I've got a high string, adding some tension. This is a string that I use in so many different tracks. Um, it's recorded from a piece of hardware that I used to own. It works, sounds nice, so I roll with it. I'm just using a little bit of volume automation to ease that in. Standard house, deep house business, adding some tension in the brakes. Cool stuff, we all know it well. Just cutting out any of those low mids, I just want it to be really kind of, it's quite quiet in the mix, giving a subtle indication that we're in a break. <laughs> so I've got another pad that's happening in the breaks. This one's a little bit different. It's kind of like a riser. A bit more mid-range. Another reason why this pad doesn't need any of this stuff here, because this one's covering those frequencies. And this one's kind of adding a bit more personality to the track. It's a bit more aggressive, a bit more dissonant. So this is just a sample and I'm using some automation on this filter frequency here. So this is what it sounds like when it's all, all the way open. Got quite a bit of resonance and drive on that just to really bring it up. I'm also automating the volume to really ease it in. I don't want it to be too abrupt when it kind of comes in.
But you'll see here when I show you the vocals, I've also got this kind of like vocal delay effects type sound. And I use things like that to kind of mask this transition of this pad coming in. This will play, take the listener's attention, and then you won't even notice that that pad's come in until it starts to get a bit louder. With that sound coming in there on the one, it kind of takes the attention, and then as that dissipates, you, you kind of notice that this pad's come in. Now, one more thing I've got here is this acid pad. Nice kind of glitchy sound, and we've got Tantra on that. So Tantra's adding a lot of that glitchiness without it. It's like an acid sample. So it's pretty, pretty similar, but Tantra just kind of makes it feel a bit deeper and kind of sits it in the back a bit, makes it a bit more interesting as well. really subtle stuff but it's kind of adding some depth and interest and texture the track still fundamentally sounds the same without it but it's just adding some kind of depth and interest and layers to the to the track and details tantra is really great for this because you can kind of take something like a loop or whatever from anywhere add it on top and ma make something different out of it which is basically what i've done here now vocal so as i showed you we've got this little glitch vocal Just an effect sound, really, but kind of nice, deep, vibey thing that fits with the track well. Works well with the in those transitions. Whoa, what's that? <laughs> okay, it looks like I was trying out something different and left in the wrong effect sound. <laughs> All right. So there you go, there's a mistake in this track and I didn't notice it until now. Anyway, here we go, this is the vocal. I'll turn off all the processing on the vocal, not the EQ. Okay, so it looks like I didn't use that Tantra and let's have a look at it. So you can see here I'm only using part of it. Underneath your skin, what's with it? Underneath your skin, what's within. So just trying to keep it really subtle with the vocals here. Um, I've got a tendency to overdo it with vocals. I like vocals and it's always a challenge for me to pair them back to just what's needed, especially with this kind of deeper stuff. You really just need some little touches, if at all. I find that difficult because I love vocals, but less is generally more. And you'll probably see that as a theme with this track. Uh, so the processing, I'm using this little altar boy and I'm bringing down the formant just to make it sound a bit deeper, adding some drive. So this is the effect. Underneath your skin, underneath your skin. So technically it sounds kind of bad, but it's just adding some real vibe. It's a bit soft and kind of mellow without it. This kind of makes it feel a bit more dissonant and dark. Uh, then I've got this rack here, which has got the dry signal coming through here, and then a tantra. Uh, the sidechain here is also sidechaining that to the dry signal. So that means when the dry signal plays, it's ducking it, and then after this stops, then you'll hear the delay and effects from the tantra. <laughs> Underneath your skin. Now let's see if we can turn this off and hear the effect. Underneath your skin. So that's really wide and it kind of it's quite distracting without the side chain there. So when the vocal's actually playing, it pushes that effect out of the way, and then when it's not playing, it kind of comes back. Underneath your skin. 
I do that a lot with a lot of different things. Parallel processing, it's awesome. Uh, then I've got this effects rack, which is basically just like a delay with a bit of decapitator, um, a bit of mix, and it's just a preset, I believe. So just adding like a bit more harshness and saturation to the vocal and a lot more delay. And I've got a glue compressor controlling the dynamics but also helping to pull up that delay and keep it a bit more spacey and atmospheric. And here with the compressor on, that's a bit more sustained. Then I'm just cutting out any of the lows. I just really want to keep this area below 100 hertz for my kick and sub. So that's the vocals. Just sending it to a little bit of ping pong and a bit of reverb. It's quite a bit of reverb in this processing chain, and I think probably already on the vocal. But it's definitely not a pop song. It's the vocals really just about adding some atmosphere and vibe. You can see I'm just using it pretty sparingly throughout in the breaks, repeating it here, then kind of repeating the last line here just before the drop. And that kind of really works because I take out a lot of the elements. You can see all the way through there. I take out all those elements while that vocal plays. Now let's have a look at the effects. Also very sparse effects. I've got a noise spray. Simple stuff, just using it once on the drop here. But remember, I'm using the sends to create that kind of reverb wash, so you also get the overflow from that. This is just to kind of give a little bit more power on the drop. Uh, I've got this percussion reverb thing, which happens just before this plays, when all this stuff stops to create a kind of moment. I'll play this in a minute and you'll hear that. I've got a reverse crash. So that's just a crash with a bunch of reverb on it. I've just added a bit more reverb and delay so that it doesn't stop so abruptly. I've got another one here with uh, another one here. Same thing basically, just with a different sound, so a different texture. And then I've got a noise sweep. Very similar thing, that's just coming into the break. Got a, another noise sweep here. Very subtle stuff, very sparse throughout the track, and I'm always sending them to a bit of delay and reverb to just help them keep them kind of like moving throughout the track so they don't just happen and disappear. It just helps them to fit in a bit more naturally. I've got a little fill which I use a couple of times. I've added Pan Man, just some randomization to move that around the stereo field. Added some reverb and then Overdrive which helps to kind of bring that stuff up without it. Subtle change, but just kind of helps it to sit in the track a bit nicer. Uh, then I've got these two percussion verb things, which are just like impact type sounds. One, this one, which I talked about before. So let's just hear this transition at this break. about how we do it. So I've already talked about the arrangement, but the idea is basically just building up all of the elements, introducing the vocal, keeping it going, building things up, bringing things in, bringing things out, bringing in another melodic element here, which is the Wurlitzer to create a bit more impact, keep things interesting, building up some tension in the break, drop, outro. Now we can have a look at the master chain. So what I'm doing here, all of these groups have the Slate Digital Virtual Console collection on them, and they're all being summed together into this one. You notice this is a light gray color, and they're all set to group one. So they're all kind of coming together into this, and then I'm using this drive to add a bit of saturation. I'm doing a little bit of clipping, which is just shaving off the top of the transients. <laughs> So 
So with the with the clipper and the limiter and the other clipper on the kick and the processing on the drum bus and oh the processing on the kick and bass bus which is just uh, some tape saturation which adds a little bit of mild compression and then I'm sending it through the same virtual console collection uh, but with all of these kind of compression type elements they're all very light very subtle it allows me to get like a loud punchy sound but without creating distortion I go into a little bit more glue compression here very very light you'll see it's just kind of like not even 1 dB That's generally about what I'm looking for. And it's just like super, super, super subtle stuff. It just helps to gel everything together a little bit. I've got this, which adds up 7 dBs of gain. And that's just so that I can hear everything at 0 dB. But if I want to make a pre-master, I just turn that off and I've got 7 dBs of headroom. Then I've got a limiter, which is just finally bringing it up to, uh, should be around minus eight LUFS. So minus eight and a half LUFS. I could probably have pushed it a little bit louder, but I think I was just trying to keep it subtle for this more deep house kind of style. So not a lot of limiting going on there, just kind of really gently pushing up the levels. And because of all the previous kind of compression and clipping and gain staging that I've done through these buses, this is getting a nice, loud, punchy sound without any kind of harshness. All right, guys, there you go. I hope you enjoyed that and you learned something from this video. If you're looking for something to watch next, then check out this one. That's it for me today. We'll catch you next time. Peace.